Thank you. It's nice of all of you to come out here tonight and uh, spend time with us and, and be engaged in what I think is critically important, and that is better education and a quality education for, for all. Every time with, I'm with Nikolai, um, he he's, draws a crowd. I'm sure that's why you, you came here tonight to hear him. He's our new dynamic superintendent, and I think we're very lucky not only to have Tim Koss as the president of Jay, we're very lucky to have uh, Nikolai leading our school system here. What I thought I'd do, I went on the state board uh, two years ago. I actually chair it now. I've chaired it for almost the last year. And um, I've learned a lot. Uh, I, I learned that there's probably more politics in education than there should be. Uh, but I also learned that uh, Florida has made tremendous progress. Uh, if you go back 14 years before Jeb Bush put into his very aggressive and bold A-plus plan, a graduation rate when you started ninth grade and graduating on time in the 12th grade was at 50%. Today it's just below 80%. It's not good enough, but it's gone in the right direction. And what I wanted to do is share with you some really vital key statistics on what's happened in the state of Florida with the improvements in education. And then take a look at, okay, well, how do we do it? What are the policies that were put in place over the last 10 to 14 years that has made Florida rank sixth last year in, uh, of the 50th states in education? So, uh, well, I'll go ahead and start with the first slide. I take the responsibility uh, seriously with the State Board of Education. Um, I was asked to serve by the governor two years ago. Uh, there are 2.7 million students in the state of Florida, so I think it's an awesome responsibility to make sure that all those kids get a quality education. We also not only oversee <clears throat> the, educa the K-12 education, but we also oversee the college system. Not the university system, that's governed by the Board of Governors, but we have the college system. And it really opened my eyes to the um, wonderful college system that we have in the state of Florida. We have 28 community colleges serving 850,000 students and a, a wonderful asset. We actually have a majority of minority student population. 56% of the students in Florida are minority. We have a very large um, population of English language learners. And the majority of students in the state of Florida are actually eligible for free and reduced lunch. So 57% of our student population uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch. The theme tonight is education policy, why it matters. And policy does matter. And first, you know, certainly it starts with leadership. It starts with leadership. It started with leadership with Governor Bush. It's, it's uh, the executive branch obviously has to make education a top priority. It also needs to be in the legislative uh, body to make sure that there's leadership both in the House and the Senate. And then I couldn't think of another L, so I said there needs to be a lots of hard work. <laughs> but in the last <clears throat> 10 years, if you go back 10 years, Florida was 30th of 41 states. There were 50 states back then, but only 41 <laughs> states that actually um, took the NAEP test, which is the nation's report card. And uh, <clears throat> more recently, this past year, 6th of 50th. So Florida's jumped from 30th to 6th in our nation's report card. Pretty, pretty significant. And if you go back to pre-reform, and I mentioned, you know, among the bottom in, in the national test, 30th of, 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 of 41 states, we had eight consecutive years of decline in the graduation rates. And we had very wide achievement gaps uh, in every area. Affluent and poor students, a 30-point gap. White and black students, 33-point. And Hispanic, uh, 18 points. So if you go back and look at um, some statistics of NAEP scores for fourth grade reading tests below basic, which is basically means functionally illiterate. In 1998, almost half of our fourth graders were functionally illiterate. I mean, think about that. Today, uh, only 25% is still not the right number, but in 2013, 25% are uh, below basic. That's a 22-point swing, and the country went from 47 to 33, which is a nine-point swing, which is about double what the country did. When you look at basic or better, we went from 53% of our kids at basic or better in fourth grade reading to 75%. And again, 22 points and doubling what the country did. If you look at the subgroups, uh, and I think this is important because if you look at all students, and it, these again are fourth grade reading NAEP scores in 2013, all students uh, 
75% basic or better versus 67. White, 85, 79, 57, 50 for black, 73, 52 for Hispanic. Low income, also better than the nation. Um, English language learners, better than the nation. And f uh, students with disability, better than the nation. So every single subgroup uh, outperforms the nation. That's pretty spectacular, I think. Um, and by the way, we are required by the No Child Left Behind Act by the government to break these out by subgroup. I've read that you know, some people think that we're being not fair, but this is how we're required to look at it um, by subgroup. And so if you fast forward and look at since 2003, so this is 10 years ago, in 2013, Florida ranks first in largest gains of students with disabilities, third with uh, largest gains in low-income students, fourth in gains for African-American students, and last year we're actually number one in gains with African-American students, and fifth in closing the racial and economic achievement gap. The dropout rate has gone down by 50%, and we've had 14 consecutive years of increased graduation rates. 14 consecutive years of increased graduation rates. We're actually number one in the country in Hispanic graduation rates. And as you know, we have a large uh, Hispanic population in Florida. So as I said earlier, policy does matter. So those are great statistics, and they're measurable, and they're real. And so what took place in the last 10, 14 years to be able to produce those kind of results? First of all, early, early literacy. And there's, there's more that needs to be done here. but. Uh, Florida was the first state in the nation to offer free voluntary pre-K. Pre Florida spends about $440 million uh, in the state of Florida to make sure that our 184,000, or about 80% of the four-year-olds, actually go to a free voluntary pre-K center. Now, there's a lot that can be done to improve that. I'll explain that in a minute. But I think that was an important policy put in place. Second, end social promotion for grade three students. That was with the Just Read Florida in 2001. So let's stop promoting third graders that are functionally illiterate. And let's make sure that they can read before we promote them on. Third, school choice. Florida, again, had led the way. 1996 was the first year of, a ch of our first charter school. Today we have 574 charter schools in Florida. And again, and I'll make some comments in a minute about how I think we can strengthen that as well. Fourth, accountability, making sure that we have standards and assessments to measure whether kids understand and uh, know those standards. And in 1999, we began grading our schools, to A through F. Wanted to make sure that we aligned our incentives and incent, incent what's working and stop funding failure. And then fifth, and more recently in 2011, SB 736 uh, focused really on effective teaching uh, with a, a new evaluation system, compensation, and employment practices, which I'll talk a little bit about. Early literacy, four-year-olds, 184,000 students, uh, about $2,400 per child, or $440 million that is spent on this in Florida. 84% of the parents select private schools. There are about 7,000 providers in the state of Florida that provide VPK service. We still need to do a better job of weeding out those VPK services that are actually being you know, more like babysitting services than they are actually teaching children. And there's some things that we can do there. Um, each child, when they enter kindergarten, is given a, a, a kindergarten readiness, readiness assessment. Uh, in the first 30 days, that assessment then is mapped back to the voluntary pre-K provider to see which voluntary pre-K providers are, are sending more prepared kids to kindergarten. Again, that, that needs to be strengthened in my opinion. We did put some money in the budget to do pre and post, -pass, pre and post testing at the, the fourth, fourth grade level because you lose a lot over the summer uh, with fourth grade, especially those that are in the disadvantaged neighborhoods. So our idea was to test at the beginning of the year for fourth grade, for the fourth, um, excuse me, four-year-olds, four and then test again at the end of that voluntary pre-K year and see what kind of movement was. And that, was, that did not get the legislation that it, it deserved, and we're going to go back at that to try to strengthen that. 
And um, the providers are watched. They're, they um, are required to have at least 70% of their children ready for kindergarten or they go on a intervene status. And if they don't improve, then we can close them down. Uh, I mentioned the uh, no social promotion, uh, looking at uh, promoting third graders that, that can't read at the basic level. So here we are, we studied uh, th almost 4,000 students, 3,975 students, and looked at the graduation rate. 80% uh, of the dropouts, 88% of the dropouts couldn't read in the third grade, in the third grade. So this is, I think, you know, I don't know what else I need to say there. I mean, we gotta make sure kids can read in the third grade or we're gonna have a disaster. Um, the statistic, double jeopardy of struggling readers, children are not reading proficiently in third grade, four times more likely to not graduate from high school. Below basic readers, almost six times more likely than proficient readers to not finish high school, and poor black and Hispanic students who are struggling readers at about eight times more likely than proficient readers to drop out of high school. And here's the statistics on it. It's been measured since it was put in place in 2002. You can see prior to 2002, only three or 3.3 percent of the kids were retained. Uh, then that jumped up uh, to 14 percent uh, of third graders that were retained. That number came down over time. And then we put in a more rigorous uh, FCAT 2.0 in 2010. It jumped up again to 7.1. And then in, we increased the proficiency standard in 2012, and it jumped up again. But I think that's a very important policy and a very good policy to make sure that we're putting emphasis on reading. And a lot of money and time and attention and talent has gone against that in the state of Florida. School choice, uh, over the si same time period, the McKay Scholarship for Students with Disabilities was put in place. There's a corporate tax credit scholarship step up for students that allows low-income students to take vouchers to a private school. Uh, charter schools, as I mentioned, there's 574 charter schools. One of the things that I've been pushing for at the state level is to try to incent what I would call the high impact, high performing, uh, call it nonprofit charter school uh, operators that do a very, very good job in the minority and the disadvantaged neighborhoods to put legislation together and incentives together to get them to come uh, to the state of Florida. I'm particularly biased about KIPP. We have a KIPP school. We have two KIPP schools here in Jacksonville. Those are the only two KIPP schools in the state of Florida. And in my, my personal opinion, I'm not against charters going wherever they go if they've got innovation and a better platform. But I particularly think that we need really robust charter schools in the lowest income and the most urban areas. And our current funding and our current incentives don't get that accomplished. So we're working to try to make that, that change. Uh, vouchers, as I mentioned, for pre-K, 184,000 kids, and then digital learning. About 300,000 of the 2.7 million kids participate in some sort of school choice in Florida. So we rank pretty high with that. Charter schools is, like I said, uh, 203,000 kids who go to charter school in the state of Florida, so you know, a little less than 10%. There's been a lot of reforms in the charter school movement. A lot of them were tied to a race for the top money that was available, of which Florida got a little over $700 million. But one of those was to reduce, remove the district caps on charter schools. Uh, the state has also done a good job uh, funding capital outlay dollars. The budget this year is $90 million for capital to help with uh, the facilities for, for charter schools. The districts throughout the state uh, basically pay for their construction of the schools and the maintenance of the schools to the ad valorem tax, and most of the districts don't share that with the charter schools. So the state basically said, okay, we'll fund it at a, at a state basis. And then uh, allowing public schools to convert charter schools, municipalities, college, colleges can create charter schools. And there's an appeal process now for those districts that are anti-charter that just refuse to put charters in. If, they, uh, if the charter operator is legitimate, they filled out their paperwork properly, and they've met all the requirements. If the district turns them down, they can come to the state board, and the state board can overrule. We have an appeal commission first, and that commission talks to the state board, and we can, we over, we can overturn that. In fact, we have five of those appeals coming up at our state boarding, board meeting next Tuesday. Okay, history of grading schools. Uh, 1995, Florida began grading schools in what was called high-performing, performing, low-performing, low and critically low-performing. In 1998, we moved to performance levels one, two, three, four, and five. 
And in 1999, we adopted what I think most people understand as the A through F system. So again, uh, I think most people will tell you that that, that accountability at the school level is important. Um, the grading system that's in place right now over the years has been tinkered with. I frankly don't believe that it statistically is as valid as it once was. And we have an opportunity with moving into our new standards and new assessments uh, next year to redo the grading system. And we're in the process of doing that. In fact, if you go to the Florida Department of Education website, the recommendation from the commissioner is up on the website on how we'd redo and be more transparent and simpler. And you can look again, if you go back in 1999 and look at the A and B schools at 515 and look at the progress of the A and B schools and then look at the D and F schools and see what happens there. The, the number went up at 179 to 280 uh, because of a, a tougher uh, standards. We it had a, a tougher assessment, F, FCAT 2.0. And then also making sure that we reward success in schools. So schools that receive um, recognition of $100 per students for improving a letter grade, earning or maintaining an A, money goes directly to principals, teachers, bypass collective bar bargaining. Um, the majority of funds historically 85% for teacher and staff and uh, those, funds, those funds get repurposed into existing funds. And over, since 1999, 20,000 schools have participated in the school recognition fund. The other is to incentivize uh, rigor. In 1984, Florida provided school district bonus for AP passage, $700. Uh, this bonus was more than uh, what it cost for the district to put it in, the free AP test. And in 1999, we realized that few students uh, in F schools were taking the PSAT. And so in 2000, uh, we put in free PSAT and plan tests for all 10th graders, professional development for teachers, and then teacher bonuses for student scores. And if, you know, I think it's really important that the money follows policy or good policy. And you can see what happens when you put a policy in place where you incentivize good behavior, and you can see what's happened here in terms of AP exams taken over the years. Pretty significant. And then last, um, and you know, I think most people that understand education would agree with me that the most effective component for student achievement is sure, cer certainly all these policies, but mo most importantly is effective teaching. Nothing, nothing trumps effective teaching in the classroom. And so over the years, back in 2002, we widened the net to allow more people to be, uh, up until that point, you had to have a Florida State Teacher Certificate of individual who graduated from approved colleges and education uh, majors only with 20, 20 credits. And then you could see, I won't read them all, but reciprocity uh, with other state certificates, two-year teaching experience and post-secondary education. Education minors now could also become effective teachers. And then the reforms that were passed in 2011, teacher evaluations in the school year 13, 14, now 50% of teacher principal evalu evaluations will base, be based on student progress, and that'll be based on a three year of data, of student data. And uh, the progress for a principal would be based upon the overall student learning gains of the students uh, on the state test. Teacher pay is also part of SB 736. And uh, raises for teachers who are rated effective or highly effective based upon new student-centered evaluations and additional pay for teachers that go into low-income areas. Teacher staffing, uh, one of the things that SB 730, uh, 736 did was eliminate LIFO, last in, first out policy, which I think is a good policy. Uh, it should be based on your merits and, and how you uh, are effective in the classroom. So you could effectively, before this was put in place, you could be a rock star teacher in the second year, and there'd be a 20-year teacher that's mediocre, and if it was time to cut, the first one, uh, the second year teacher would go. I don't think that's a good, a good, uh, good strategy. And now principals have the authority to not accept the placement of any teacher in their school is not effective or highly effective. And then parents who are, um, who are placed in classrooms with teachers who are evaluated as ineffective or needs improvement must be notified of their designation. And then most, I think, more importantly, as we move to a new teacher contract, all teachers hired after July 1st are on an annual contract, so all new teachers effectively uh, tenure has been eliminated. So those are the 
Those are the reforms. I, I picked five, I think, major reforms that had a lot to do with those statistics and very good statistics that I shared with you earlier. There are other policies and reforms. And, um, but at this point in time, I think it's, uh, those are my comments. I think we're going to uh, have Nikolai or Rick come up and uh, we'll entertain questions in a minute after Nikolai speaks. Right? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, Rick, thank you for that introduction and for organizing and making this happen. Tim, uh, I share your, your compliments. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and, and your wife, and I look forward to continuing to work with JU to strengthen our partnership. Um, I don't know if uh, we know this um, as much as we should, but we are lucky to have someone like Gary Chartran in our community. Um, Gary is a tireless advocate of children on multiple levels, and uh, I I uh, appreciate his leadership, his friendship, and what he brings um, to Jacksonville. We are very lucky to have someone like that in our community. And, and I can, as someone who's been in many different cities, um, I wish every city had a Gary Chartrand. I think um, kids would be um, better served if they did. So Gary, thank you for your leadership um, and your dedication to children. Um, <laughs> so Jason Fisher and Ashley Smith Juarez, um, I know that I, I receive, um, I have over the last 14 months maybe received a lot of um, accolades and criticism because you don't, you don't create change without pushback. But I'm only um, as effective as my board allows me to and supports me and pushes me and gives me um, the right feedback and guidance. And um, although I may out, be out in front as superintendent, I, I do believe that I have a seven member board that has embraced reform and supported uh, me and more importantly, children. And uh, as we move forward, we have to do this together. So Jason and Ashley, thank you for your service and what you do for the community along with me as we make a better situation for children. Thank you. So I, um, I, I was misinformed. I thought this was a debate. And <laughs> this would be one podium. We'd have another one here. We have a flag. And Gary and I would debate education policy in Florida. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, but with that said, I'm, I'm going to try to be brief because I want to allow the, um, the audience here to ask questions about where we are statewide with ed policy and where we are in Jacksonville. I think one way to think about um, policy as far as Duval County Public Schools is oftentimes in education, we talk a lot about uh, the heart and passion that, that, that educators have for children, and that's essential. But I think what's different about Duval County Public School is it, schools is that we still have the heart and passion, but we function with a sense of urgency and a bottom line perspective when it comes to student achievement. And I think um, you need that in, in today's um, public education system. You have to believe deeply, as we all do, that children can do great and wonderful things, but that doesn't happen by just talking rhetoric. You have to have the systems, the processes, the strategies, the initiatives to make a new system and allow children to succeed at a higher level. And that's what's happening in Duval County Public Schools right now, is that we're not just talking about reform, we're changing the system. We're changing how we support our employees and more importantly, push our children to higher levels. Um, now, how do you do that? You start with a strategic plan. And we revamped our strategic plan by engaging the community, building off the work that was done by JPEF on the one by one campaign, and getting out to the community, multiple town hall meetings, and asking people, what do you want out of your public education system? We used that feedback, and then we developed a very simplistic but focused strategic plan that has four focus areas. Very simple but concrete. One, um, develop great leaders um, and great educators. Two, engage the community. Three, be more efficient and effective with resources. And four, develop the whole child. That defines our work. And we took those four big goals and created a, um, a very specific targets. Everything from reading proficiency, math proficiency, to graduation rate, um, to how many kids are in extracurricular activities, um, and, and, and water, uh, water usage, um, energy usage, and we have a, a very um, multi-dimensional, broad targets when it comes to our four goals. And that is very unusual for public education. Um, we do not often measure what we expect. We talk about it, but we don't measure it, and we don't build the systems to allow it to happen. And that's what we're doing um, now in Duval County Public Schools. 
And so those targets were not randomly decided. What we, what we did was we looked at the state average in Florida. We have 67 districts in Florida. And we said that we, in one year, would reach the state average in all the indicators that are linked to student achievement, reading, math, science, writing, um, graduation rate, at-risk graduation rate, acceleration, meaning the kids that take AP classes, do enrollment classes, industry certification, and everything is driven by those targets and those four big goals. Um, so we have become a very systematic, strategic, focused organization in order to do better for kids. Again, not just talk about it, but actually do it. Um, so let me talk to you very briefly about some of the things that we're doing in each of those four areas. Um, one, when we're talking about developing leaders and teachers, we revamped our curriculum um, in that we, tr we created um, curriculum guides that were aligned to the Common Core at the primary level and in a blended uh, F uh, Florida standards with the Common Core at the elementary, middle school level. And, um, and high school level. Uh, we trained over 5,000 teachers over the summer in, with those, that curriculum in mind. We aligned assessments um, to those curriculum guides. Uh, we revamped our leadership model to move um, uh, our leadership development to internship base, where, where leaders are mentored and, and, and shadow um, mentor type principles. I think most. Um, importantly when we talk about developing teachers is that we were able to negotiate common planning and that goes a long way at the, mainly at the middle school and high school level so for the first time um, teachers now up to an hour every week plan together and you may ask well why is that important it's important because teachers learn through one another. Too many of our teachers function in isolation. I remember as a teacher, the only time I talked to another teacher is if I w was walking to the uh, parking lot or was to happen to be next to a teacher when making photocopies. But never did I observe another teacher teach, never did I share best practices, never did I create lesson plans with another, a fellow teacher. And so we're trying to improve morale but build capacity at the school level within our, by our teachers and for our teachers um, so that they're learning from one another. And what you do when, you, when that happens is you calibrate high-level teaching and high-level expectations, but through teachers themselves, not necessarily through a top-down approach, but more bottom-up um, and more of a, a horizontal approach to reform and the building of capacity. Um, when we look at engaging parents, many of you know or should know that we developed a parent academy. Um, in only a couple months, we've already engaged 900 parents. Um, and on issues from how to teach literacy in the home, uh, what are the graduation requirements, how do you fill out a FAFSA form, um, how, do you, um, um, how can you better create a, an environment at, in the home for discipline, um, how do you um, build credit to save for a home. Um, so this is uh, the focus of the Parent Academy and this is um, uh, co countywide and not just driven by the Parent Academy but in partnership with other entities throughout um, uh, Jacksonville. Our other area of focus is to be more efficient with our resources. So what we did uh, last year, which was grueling, um, is we went through a zero-based budgeting process. Every cent, and I can tell you, every cent was examined. We asked the question of how our existing initiatives linked to the new strategic plan, what was the return on investment from a student achievement point of view with old initiatives, and um, that, that we questioned almost every line in the budget and made very hard decisions, but ultimately what ended up happening in that process is we moved seven million dollars from the district level back to schools um, and, and talking about the whole child, we put a music art and PE teacher at every elementary school. Um, we put a music and art teacher to one of, of each or two of one in every middle school. So when people ask, well, how did you fund all these new and different things? We didn't have a money tree in the backyard. We just reinvented our budget and moved dollars to schools and aligned it to the strategic plan. Um, the other area of focus, um, a as I mentioned, was um, the whole child, which I think is probably the most exciting um, part of what's happening in Duval County Public Schools right now. I mentioned the music, art, and PE teachers. Um, but in addition to that, we have a graduation coach at every high school to make sure that um, in, in all of our Title I schools, kids are graduating, they're not falling through the cracks. Um, I, I mentioned um, our expansion of art and music at the middle school level. We are expanding our dual language programs at the elementary level. 
We've, we've almost doubled the number of our four-year-old classrooms. Um, and, and so uh, can go on in much more. But when we talk about the whole child, I think what's important to understand is that although we certainly believe that the bottom line is about student achievement, we know that you can't just focus on a test. And a test does not solely define a child's intellectual potential. And so in thinking about the arts, we know that, and research is clear, that if we develop children um, through the arts, likely their student achievement will improve in reading and math, science, and writing. Um, but we, we should think of the arts no differently than we think of a reading or a math teacher. You would never envision getting rid of a reading or a math teacher in budgetary um, um, tough situations. Why would you ever think about removing a music or an art teacher? And so we believe that as we deal with kids and build kids beyond reading math and science, that they will uh, ine inevitably do better when it comes to student achievement. Give you some statistics and then, and then I'll stop and we'll open it up to questions. But where we are right now in Duval County Public Schools is we've we reached our highest level of graduation rate. We're at 72%, um, which is about um, anywhere it's about a five to um, a high four percentage point increase from the year before. Uh, we narrowed the gap between us and the state average and graduation rate by four times in one year. Um, and so a lot of the work that we started, even in the first couple months of the new administration, is reflected in that graduation rate. Um, but also most excitingly is that um, when you look at our graduation rate of the big seven districts in Florida, and that's what we're looking at as a, as a measurement, in one year, we want to hit the state average. In the next year, uh, we want to exceed performance of the big seven throughout the state of Florida. So big seven being Miami, Broward, Palm Beach, Tampa, Orlando, um, Pinellas, because that's a more apples to apples comparison. We have to stop comparing ourselves to St. John's because St. John's on average doesn't teach the same child that we do in Jacksonville. So our goal state average, then the big seven, um, and so when you look at graduation rates in, of the Big Seven, we had the greatest improvement of the Big Seven in one year. We also saw the biggest improvement with our African American students. Um, we saw the biggest improvement uh, with our at-risk uh, graduation. Those are kids that are below grade level in reading math when they enter high school. So we are already moving the needle, but uh, uh, this is part of the transparency. We are not there yet. When we look at reading, when we look at math, when we look at science, uh, when we look at writing and we look at where Duval is compared to the Big Seven, we're anywhere from the bottom um, to the lower tier, and that has to change. So although we see improvement, we have to start becoming more competitive uh, among the Big Seven as we move forward and trans continue to transform our district. Uh, I will also tell you that the greatest challenges that we have moving forward, uh, one is technology. Um, and, and so Gary talked about capital funding. Um, our kids today need um, schools that have wireless access. Our kids today need one-to-one -one devices. Now, that's not a silver bullet. You can't replace great teaching. That's the number one factor that determines student achievement. But our kids today think and learn through technology. I have four children under the age of four. They think through technology, meaning they're not going to necessarily read a book like I or you did they're going to use technology to gain in access in, to information. So we have to equip them with the tools to be competitive moving forward. Our other challenge is human capital. And, and anytime you're talking about taking an organization to another level, you have to have the best and the brightest in your core um, um, positions. And your core positions in a school system is in the classroom, so teachers, and then leaders, principals and assistant principals, and then people at the district level that make a lot of the policy decisions. And that, we have struggled in Jacksonville. We have pockets of great leaders, but A, they don't stay long enough, and B, they're in pockets. They're, it's not an at-scale situation. And so um, part of transforming Jacksonville is to realize that we are a large urban school district. We are not a small rural school district any longer. But a lot of times, we approach the work like a small rural school district. And so a large urban school district recruits nationally for talent. Um, they become more competitive with reaching out for talent, and they find ways to retain those that they've homegrown, to recruit outside, but once performance is demonstrated, we find ways to keep people. 
We have to do a better job when it comes to that here, especially in our lowest performing schools. And, and I think you're going to hear some announcements um, coming um, in, in, in the future where we're going to dramatically incentivize our best teachers to stay in our toughest schools and our best teachers outside of our toughest schools to move into our toughest schools so that we can ensure that every student has a great teacher from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. And so the achievement gap um, is, and, and I always say this, there is no achievement gap at birth. It's social economic factors that create and exacerbate um, this, the achievement gap, and I will say oftentimes the um, ineffective teachers and not a systematic situation with teachers with a continuum of effective teachers also exacerbates the, achie the achievement gap. So if we can be more strategic with K-12, to an outstanding teacher, not only and better early learning, and that's what we're trying to do, we won't be talking about achievement gap, we'll be talking about kids that outperform their peers because they have that great teacher all the way through. Um, those are some of the challenges, I think, where we are right now as a school district. But I look forward um, to your comments and, and to the greater conversation. We should all be um, feeling fortunate that these type of forums exist because I can tell you throughout the country, these forums don't exist where people have the high level conversations when it comes to public education. So thank you for being here. So I'm seeing that, that that's a big issue in Newball County with the behavior problems. There's uh, nobody in there to help the teacher. Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, one, I think we always, and we, we have to recognize that um, our parents don't leave their best children at home. Um, and, and so we, the beauty, what I often say with, about public education, the beauty of public education is that we take all. No matter what struggles, no, no matter what disability, what, what, no matter what disadvantages, we take all children. And that means um, oftentimes behavior starts at the home. We know that. Um, and so we're charged to do everything we can to take that child from here to here, from here to there, and, and to, to the next level. So a lot of the issues that I think we see in school is a manifestation often of what's not happening at home. But, but with that said, um, I often say we take children wherever they are and take them to another level. We have to own that once they're in the classroom. I think one thing that you see in our schools is, is that if you go to our schools and you visit our classrooms, I would say, I would say 95 percent of the classrooms are, are a place of high level learning where kids are focused and, and doing the right thing. It's always the minority of kids that are problematic. The other issue is that classroom management oftentimes is more a function of what the teacher is doing and, and the systems that are in place than the individual children. So even children that are problematic will step in line if there's a right system and structure in the classroom, and I've seen that as a teacher and, and as an administrator. What we've done um, is a couple things. One, uh, we made every child be exposed to the code of conduct in the beginning of the year. That did not happen. So every school started the year off, what is the code of conduct, what are the, what are the infractions, and what are the consequences? We put a dean of discipline at every middle school and every high school. Uh, we put an in-school suspension program in every middle school and every high school. Um, and so th those were alternatives to outdoor suspensions, which I don't think necessarily works as a place and a time. Um, but I will say the bigger issue, aside from classroom management and all that, and this is something that I didn't mention in the opening, is mental health. And this is a serious issue that we have to put our arms around when it comes to public education. And I would say the city as a whole is that some of our kids, the ones that we know are the most disruptive and most problematic, are, are disruptive and problematic everywhere because they are dealing with issues that can't be resolved just through a teacher. And, and we're asking teachers to be the teacher, the guidance counselor, the social worker, the, and the psychologist, the parent, the uncle, the aunt, the grandmother, et cetera. And, and that's not fair to a teacher. We have to create a scenario where a teacher can teach the content that they're, they're told. So I think that moving forward, it's continuing to improve the classroom management and, and the consequences and the relationship piece, but we must create a mental health approach so that we can properly tier kids. So if it's a behavioral problem, we'll deal with it. If it's a mental health issue, that's a whole nother intervention that we are not doing. So back to the beginning, beauty and the beast of public education, we take all, and that means we are taking on kids that have deep issues that we're not tackling 
systematically as a school system and as a city that we need to in order to create environments where all kids can learn? Well, I think <clears throat> Nikolai hit on it, the technology infrastructure and making sure that we have uh, the right professional development and also the digital learning capabilities in the school. I don't think we have led in that at, in Florida. Um, we, we're not the worst, but we haven't led. And um, you know, a lot of it's related to the budget as well. We have uh, $40 million in the budget last year for technology improvements and another $40 million this year. And quite frankly, it's not nearly enough. In fact, I think, Nikolai, you could probably spend all four, well, 40 million, million right here. So we and, 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 and that doesn't even address the issue. No. Right. 40 million right. statewide? Yeah, statewide. So, so, but a lot of districts have done things on their own, and they've used a lot of their money to, uh, that they, they, they get from the system to increase broadband. They've, you know, Nikolai did a, a QZAP bond here that raised $30 million for low-income schools. Um, so I, I would say the biggest concern that I have right now is making sure that we have a well thought out um, technology plan and, and infrastructure and also digital learning uh, for the state of Florida. The other more recent uh, issues that are on the table right now are the, um, the new Common Core, as it's called, will be actually renamed the New Florida Standards, um, and making sure that those are implemented across the state we have a discussion about that at the state board meeting on Tuesday to make sure that we pick the right assessment that measures those standards and also has interstate comparability so we can measure our kids across state. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, making sure that we re revamp the grading system to add more credibility to the grading system to make it simpler, simpler and um, streamline the grading system. And then last but not least is making sure that we also have the right systems in place for um, eff effective teaching and teacher, teacher evaluations. I'm not sure that we've figured that out yet. And I think it's important that we have the right, it, the worst thing in the world that can happen is you tell an ineffective teacher that they're effective and vice versa, that an effective teacher is ineffective. And so we gotta get that system right. It's a difficult process. There's a lot of people working on it, but we gotta get that right. Well, you make a good point. If you look at our schools right now, um, over 60% of our schools were built 50 years ago. And so think about that. Go back 50 years and no one even thought of a computer, nevertheless, wireless infrastructure or a, an iPad. Um, and so that's the challenge. What uh, our estimate is right now is to make every school wireless and to give a one-to-one -one device to every child throughout Duval County, uh, it would cost about $150 million. And, and so what we've done, and Gary mentioned it, is um, uh, use um, bonds that are uh, long-term bonds at a very low interest rate in, in, in order to attack the issue where the greatest concern is in our high poverty schools. And we did that by creating a match and, and getting um, um, local donors to contribute. Um, and that has really made a difference and will make a difference in 40 high poverty schools. Uh, it was about a $30 million bond. Um, there might be an opportunity to go out to get more bonds like that, and we're, we're pursuing that. But ultimately, I do believe maybe uh, a year or two years from now, we're going to have to do something citywide in order to um, build the infrastructure and provide the one-to-one -one devices I don't know if that's going to happen at the state level, so we may have to do this locally. Um, this happened in Miami where we did pass a major bond, but I don't think that that can happen in Jacksonville until we've increased the credibility throughout the city in the public education system. And I think that's our challenge right now. I think we're moving in the right direction. I think people feel much better where we are, but we're not there yet. So I think it's premature to go to voters and ask for something like that until we continue to raise student achievement um, we see graduation rates increase, better schools, and then I think the city will be more willing to invest in a major project like that, but we're not ready yet um, to engage the greater community on that issue. <clears throat> yeah, just make a, a, a comment because the, 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 the theme is pol policy matters. And, you know, one thing, as I, as I take um, a look at what's going on in the state of Florida and bring a business perspective, if you will, to education, and that is to make sure that every dollar that is spent is spent efficiently and effectively and efficiently 
um, and I've been saying this since I got on the state board, in 2002, the voters of Florida passed a class size amendment. And the class size amendment was that there would be no more than 18 kids, K-3, 22 in middle school, and 25 in high school. And there are negative consequences to passing something like that and putting it in the Constitution. And it started at the district average, and then it went to the school average, and then now it's at the class. So uh, if you have a third grade class and you have 18 children, and the 19th children sh child shows up, his, his, his decision is to hire a new teacher for that one child or take a fine from the state. And that's me, I'm the one that finds them. So, but I'm just abiding the law, abiding by the law. So to me, that's, that's, um, that is a silly approach. Um, I, I'm not saying that I, would, I want 50 kids in a class. However, if you just moved it from the class to the average of the school, the school average, and you ran the numbers on the savings that you could get from that, it's somewhere between 600 and 700 million dollars per year, every year, that then could be reinvested into technology, into technology infrastructure and blended learning. And unfortunately, it's in the Constitution, and we need a 60% vote. First of all, you gotta get it on the ballot to overturn it, and then you gotta get 60% of the vote. And it's a tough one because intuitively you think, well, smaller class sizes, that's, a, that's better. I want smaller class sizes. The negative consequences are there's no flexibility at the school level. Uh, there also is negative consequences because it's only for core classes, so the electives get filled up with too many kids in the class. So there's a policy that was put in, in front of the voters that was voted in that's hard to reverse that, in my opinion, is wasting $600 million a year. Hello, uh, my name is Laura Aki. I'm a school counselor at Inglewood High School here in Jackson, Florida. I'm also a graduate of Inglewood High School, so it's very cool. Um, we're about 75% free and reduced lunch right now. We have a very high ELL population. Um, I consider myself a social change agent. I'm, I'm very, very happy with a lot of the changes that are going on, but on the day-to-day, you know, being a school counselor, you know, I really enjoy what you said, where parents don't leave their, you know, best kid at home. They send the child that they have to school, and, a, you know, students made up of the sum of their experiences, and that means, you know, they're 17 years old, and they're in a ninth grade home room, and they can't read, and so as a, you know, being policy-minded, making large policies for the day-to-day, -day, you know, people in the schools, how do you consider that whole child, you know, when that student comes to you, and really the best thing for the school is to, as a senior and they're 18 years old and they haven't passed the FCAT, they may have their credits, but the best thing to do is really to get them to an alternative placement school so you get them off your books. But really the best thing for that kid is to keep them there and give them as much attention as you can and try to educate them in the best way, not just get rid of them. So how do you, you know, negotiate that larger policy for the greater good versus the day-to-day -day that child sitting in front of you? Well, I think, I think what you spoke to um, can be associated to the discipline issue. It can be um, connected to um, an approach of one size fits all. I mean, I think that the good thing that's happened nationally is that we have the expectation that all children go to college, and I think that's the right expectation. But we have to figure out how to, how to even become more versatile with options as kids move into high school. And I don't think and we're trying to bring this back to Duval, which is industry certification and career technical education. Because I, I think we're actually setting a lot, too many kids up for failure when we say everyone goes to college. And that doesn't mean that I have a less expectation of you, but the reality is, is that certain kids are extremely gifted when it comes to working with their hands, as opposed to uh, reading a book and taking a test. Um, and, and, but we have to become much more flexible on that front. But to your specific issue, what has happened too long in Duval County Public Schools and, and throughout, I think, public education in general, is we continue to pass kids along grade after grade. They become farther and farther behind. And so um, that's why we've put uh, much more investment in early learning. Um, because we know that if kids are ready to, to read by third grade, and, and the problem in Duval and throughout Florida and throughout the country, specific to, to Florida, is we don't think about reading until third grade from an accountability point of view. You don't teach a child how to read in third grade. You teach a child how to read in pre-K. Um, you teach a child how to read in the womb. But we have to engage parents to understand that, and then we have to build better systems at the primary level, and we've done that, and we're continuing to build on that. But 
we have to start being more strategic on the literacy front early. And then what we've also done is revamp curriculum. At the middle school level, if you know, we're becoming more explicit with kids that are behind, they can't decode. So we're not thinking standards, we're thinking basic skills. How do you decode, prefix, suffix? Um, and, and we have to do that, and that's how we've restructured the curriculum. But I also will talk to mental health again, in that there has to be a way to move kids to your, uh, uh, I, I, even, I don't know you personally, but I've heard good things about Inglewood's guidance counselors. Um, so I know what you do on a day-to-day on a -day basis, but you can't deal with all of the kids that have the, what I call the tier three type of mental health behavioral issues. You can. You can, you're great at what you do, you love kids, you love that individual kid that you talked about, but you're not equipped with, this, with the support structure to then give that child a different opportunity. And that's what we haven't done well. We're starting to do it better at the classroom level academically, but we are, we are not even scratching the surface on that issue, on the mental health piece, on the behavioral piece, and that's what needs to change. What is the policy on discipline? I was amazed to find out that police can come into the school and arrest a student. And so the policy will be what in the future? Is it to continue this policy that's, that's happening? Or so um, the policy for discipline for the most, there are certain statutes that dictate policy, but most of it's at the local level. Uh, a police officer, um, depending on the situation, could come into a school and arrest a student if there's a warrant and the, uh, and the understanding is the child is at a school and can be arrested. But I can tell you that in the, in the partnership we have with JS, uh, JSO, that rarely happens. Where, and, and, and I have been very adamant that schools are safe havens and, and we don't arrest kids when they come to school. Now, if there's an outstanding warrant, we wait after school, there's a way to pull that child out, we do things like that, but no, we, we rarely have um, warrants served, if you will, or, um, at the school level. We have our own police um, in, in Duval um, to deal with those kind of issues. Could you also talk about Common Core? Um, sure. The future of it, because I know that there's a lot of well, I think Gary spoke to it. I'll talk to it at, about it at the local level as a superintendent. Um, I think we need to get over the fear of Common Core. Um, I, at the end of the day, I think we all agree that every child should have access and be exposed to the highest of standards. And what's happening throughout our country is depending on the zip code that you grow up or the state you grow up, you're exposed to inferior standards. And so we're lucky in Florida that when standards are reviewed, Florida is near the top when it looks at our current standards, but I think we can do even better. But this is an issue, not only one of Florida, but throughout the country. You, just because you grow up in Alabama shouldn't mean that you're exposed to inferior standards as compared to um, New York or Massachusetts or Florida. And so we have to get out of the provincial mind of, of thinking of this local process. This is. We are the only, one of the only industrialized countries in the world that don't have national assessments. Why? We're the only, one of the only industrialized countries in the world that don't have national standards and assessments. We're the only country in the world that thinks like this. We can't think 50 states anymore. We have to think as a country, as a nation. And we're competing internationally. So as states, uh, as countries throughout the world, are really systematic with what kids should know at every grade level, at every subject. We're still talking about why a, a localized control of education. We're, we, we're talking international competition. The more we stay in this provincial thinking, the farther and farther behind our kids get, especially those that are growing up in poverty throughout the country. The other thing is in Florida, we are well positioned to do well on the Common Core. So I, I'm, 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 if you don't know, I'm a competitor, and we are positioned as Florida. You saw the data. The work that has happened over the ten, past 10 years, we are, are in a position to, to see, to reap the rewards of that process when we move to the Common Core and Common Core assessments because our kids are more ready. We see that in NAEP. So it wouldn't it be great to tell the story, instead of always comparing ourselves to St. John's, which we always do, why don't we compare Jacksonville to Chicago, to Detroit, 
to um, uh, to um, Charlotte. And and I will I'll tell you because of our standards historically, Jacksonville will outcompete many of those large urban districts. I know that because I know the standards and I know what our kids can do. Then industries will say, well, if I have to decide to go to Jacksonville or Charlotte or Jacksonville or more Mobile, Alabama, where am I going to go? I'm going to go to Jacksonville because the kids are functioning at a higher level than they are in other cities. So let's stop being afraid of change. Let's embrace it because ultimately our kids are going to do better. And all of us are fear. All of us know that we're teaching the test doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. The Common Core forces our kids to think. They're going to have to apply. They're going to have to synthesize, um, analyze um, information, and write, which we, that's an art that we've lost. So instead of formulaic writing, they're going to read a passage, and then they're going to have to say, do you ag agree, disagree, why? I think all of us would, would say that is higher level critical thinking skills that we've lost through is the answer A, B, C, or D. There's going to be a bit of that on Common Core, but moving to writing and application and thinking, which we know our kids uh, need to be able to do with an international market. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Rick, for, uh, for hosting us here. I think uh, education policy does matter, and I, hopefully I we articulated that with some, some pretty real statistics on what's happening in Florida. I would tell you from where I sit, at least at the state board level, that we should feel good about what's happened in Florida over the last 10 years, but we shouldn't be satisfied because uh, we still, as a country, uh, in fact, if you look at where we rank of uh, the industrialized countries, we're, we're not, we're 21st in reading and 25th in math out of 35 <laughs> countries. So. Uh, to Nikolai's point, this is the global economy, and we've got to raise our standards. And there's a lot of fear, and there's a lot of talk about the Common Core, and you know, Obama's taken over uh, education along with the healthcare. It's not true. The uh, the National Governors Association put together the standards. It was done with educators, it was done with researchers, and it was an opt-in from a state-by-state -state perspective. Forty-five states assigned on to Common Core. Um, and so, you know, I, I agree with Nikolai totally that we've got to continue to raise our standards and we've got to make sure that, <clears throat> the, that um, our kids are held to the same standards. And quite frankly, I don't even talk about mobility, but if you're in the third grade and the standards are you're supposed to learn this in Florida and something else in Massachusetts, you go into the fourth grade when you move to Massachusetts, you could be lost. So getting those standards across the states is just a smart thing for mobility as well. Um, I appreciate everybody coming out here tonight. I, I um, uh, myself and my wife Nancy is here tonight, taking an interest uh, in, in education. We've gotten, uh, gotten involved and uh, trying to make a difference and serving in any way we possibly can to, to make education better for our kids. And I think you coming out here tonight shows that you're interested in that as well. So. I'd ask you all to continue to get engaged and continue to push Nikolai for the best school system. <laughs> he needs another few bosses. Um, but he's a, he's a great leader. He's going to make a lot of great changes for us here, and I'm, I'm totally supportive of him. And, um, but be demanding on him. They're your schools. Taxpayers pay for the schools. I'm on the theme of demanding. Um, I, I would say I encourage you to demand. I, I think um, we, in public education, we have um, too often focused more on supply and not demand, meaning supply, we've always assumed that kids would come to the neighborhood school. Um, choice, on a positive level, has led to more competition and options for families, and, and unfortunately, they have opted out of public education, traditional public education. Now is the time to be more competitive and bring those parents back, but the competitive environment has allowed us to recognize that we have to do things differently. And, and, and so um, part of that is to shift our system from one that focuses on supply to demand and recognize that our customers are parents and children, and they have options, but the product is educational excellence and services, and that happens in the classroom, it happens how we engage parents on a day-to-day -day basis in children. And if we increase and improve our product, educational um, delivery, instruction, and service, parents will come back. But I, one 
thing that defines Jacksonville to me is a level of civic engagement, um, which is our greatest um, potential. But it also needs to, we have to stop talking about Duval County Public Schools in Jacksonville from a potential point of view. Um, I've now been here 14 months and I always hear the word potential. Let's talk about what we're doing and what, where we're going and who we are and who we want to be and actually get in the game, get off the sidelines and get on the field in some way, some capacity, in order to make this school district better. Because if everyone puts their shoulder to the wheel, this will become a national model for public education. There are so many good things already happening in pockets, but it's about taking it to scale. And I do believe this city is primed to have that kind of education system, but we have to get off the sideline and get onto the field in some way or another. Thank you.